Hi, and welcome to uh, this month's webinar, the first in a series uh, looking at application storage. And uh, we're going to be looking at storing data in Backblaze B2 uh, across multiple regions and then uh, delivering that content with low latency through uh, Fastly's content delivery network. So let's look at the problem we're going to solve and uh, then my co-speaker and I will introduce ourselves. So, Jim, uh, this is really in your department, like delivering content as fast as possible, right? Yeah, I mean, this is you know what we say, and what our new CEO is making us uh, make sure to focus on is you know we're about it. We're a user experience company, and about improving and speeding up and securing that user experience. And a lot of that comes down to latency and how milliseconds matter. And I love that you you put a Jacob Nielsen quote in. And, you know, as an old HTML developer in the '90s, like that's that's good stuff. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, every, anything anything below 100 milliseconds kind of feels instantaneous. Yeah. Um, but then, yeah, we do start to notice, and you know, in the limit. You know, it's funny. There's um there's an old IBM research paper. The uh, uh, I think it's called like Doherty threshold where hmm. it's actually a bit of a curve where essentially like anything under 300 milliseconds you perceive as interactive and anything under like, you know, 50, hundred milliseconds you perceive as instantaneous. And then, you know, farther up the lane, you get more and more frustrated. Uh, but the, the relationship is such that users that get faster experiences, even if they're only hundred milliseconds will themselves go and do the next step a full second or two sooner. Right. So improving the response time of the system isn't just about the system. It's about the interaction with the people that will adopt and engage with it more. And anything more than about five seconds and you go check your email. Close tab, yeah. <laughs> so um, I am Pat Patterson. I'm the uh, chief technical evangelist here at Backblaze. I've been here for uh, about a year now. And I'm joined by uh, Jim Bartas. Jim, introduce yourself and, and what do you do at Fastly? Hi, uh, so I'm a sales engineer for the channel and partnerships team. Uh, so I do things like this. Excellent. All right, so what we're gonna be talking about, we're gonna give you a little bit of uh, context about uh, the two companies and how we work together. And then I'm gonna talk about our new uh, Backblaze US East region, our latest data center and how you can replicate data between different regions for a, a variety of purposes. You might want to do that as well as uh, delivering content to end users as fast as possible. Then we'll move into uh, solving the actual problem. You've, you've got uh, content in different regions. How do you get it to the right users um, from the right data center? So we'll kind of delve into uh, how we were able to map out uh, latency across the globe, and then how you can put that uh, to work. So uh, let's jump in. So uh, Backblaze B2 Cloud Storage. If you're not already familiar, it's uh, S3 compatible cloud object storage that is simple to use. You can get started literally with just an email address and a password. You don't even need a credit card to get uh, 10 gigabytes free of charge. Um, we, are, we have uh, thousands of customers, so well over two exabytes now of customer data. And we're priced at $5 per terabyte per month, which is about uh, between a fifth and a quarter of the price of hyperscalers like uh, Amazon S3. And we're S3 API compatible. So pretty much anything you do with S3, you can equally do with Backblaze B2. Jim, give us the high level view of Fastly. Yeah, so uh, we're a global edge cloud platform, right? Uh, and where edge cloud is, is the things that are deployed geographically around the globe as close to the users as possible to reduce that latency as much as possible. Uh, and so that originally started out as the simplest thing a computer can do, copy bytes, so caching. Uh, and over time, it's evolved into DDoS protection, web application firewalling, application routing logic, like we're about to describe. Uh, and so really, it's a, it's a, a forward deployed sort of code position to handle routing and ingestion and securing of traffic and user experiences you know, of all the requests and responses. And I should point out, given your last slide uh, and the fact that we're both here today, uh, is that your 
API is both S3 compatible and the egress from it to our environment is uh, discounted or free. Uh, and that's what makes us such a great front end back end pairing. Peanut butter and chocolate. Yeah. So, uh, and, and it's I, one thing I'll, I'll mention actually that just came to mind. I probably everybody listening to this call has received data through Fastly. It's like, it's like an invisible link in the chain that even if you're requesting data from uh, acme.com, it may well be delivered by Fastly or another content delivery network. Yeah, it's, it's you know, for basically any major money making competitive internet property or website or, or service, um, it's table stakes these days uh, that you have some amount of your workload pushed to the edge. And it's really just a question of the adoption curve of how much of it we can get out there. All right. So, like as I mentioned, we 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 work together uh, closely. We have a partnership between Backblaze and Fastly, and really, this gives you the ability to deploy uh, scalable, affordable, uh, high performance um, content storage and delivery. So, Backblaze is where you uh, store your data, the origin or back end, if you like. And Fastly is the conduit by which you get it uh, to your users with the lowest possible latency. And as Jim mentioned a moment ago, we have zero cost egress from Backblaze B2 to um, Fastly. And that is something that uh, you know, our customers definitely take advantage of. In several cases, we've had customers come to us because they were paying egress charges from their uh, storage vendor to Fastly, and uh, they found that they could save a lot of money uh, mm -hmm. with Backblaze B2. Yeah, it, it gets particularly acute in the in the larger file sizes, like images and the videos, and in the longer tails uh, of more user generated content or you know like very large libraries, where that cache ratio might not be able to prevent as much of that egress. And so where that's where this partnership really sort of helps solve for. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, we launched our newest Backblaze region uh, last month, uh, December, and so we now have a, a new data center. So um, before December, we had two regions. So US West, the data centers are actually located in California and Arizona, and our Amsterdam data center in the Netherlands. And in December, uh, we added a data center in Reston, Virginia. And this is uh, a picture of our actual uh, data center there as we were provisioning it. I have to ask, is the, uh, is the third picture there in California uh, really a data center in the water? It absolutely is. That's our data center in Stockton, and that's the San Joaquin River. And it's a facility called Nautilus. And Absolutely, there are some number of thousands of uh, machines in that box, and it floats in the river. Uh, those piles allow it to float up and down, and it is cooled by the river water. That's incredible. So there's a heat exchanger system. The river water isn't flowing around the data center, um, and we uh, the data center ingests river temperature water and then releases it, I think, four degrees Fahrenheit warmer. Mm -hmm. downstream and the so the entire uh, data center is cooled that way there's no um uh conventional air conditioning it's like it's a ground source heat pump, cool. but river source heat pump exactly yeah it's 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 cooled by that uh that uh river water there is a blog post uh, that explains all about it i'll put it in the uh resources cool check it out great so um we've got three regions um, let's look at why you might want to actually uh, take advantage of that. So uh, again, last year, we introduced a feature called cloud replication. And this allows you to um, take one of your, or take any number of buckets and define rules to replicate data to another uh, region. So you might want to do that for um, compliance, continuity. You, you, there might be rules that say you have to have a copy of the data uh, some distance away from the master copy. Uh, some customers use it 
for uh, testing and staging. They have a copy of their production data that they can run code against. So you can you can actually repli replicate into another bucket within the same region uh, for that kind of use case. But what we're talking about today is replicating data between regions to get it closer to those end users. Because even if you're caching data um, within uh, Fastly, the cache has a finite size and getting data into that cache takes time. So when the data's being loaded into the cache, your user is still waiting. And as Jim said a moment ago, um, large files are not always amenable to, to caching. So, so Fast is actually basically acting as a, as a proxy in that kind of instance, right? Yeah, fundamentally, the, the product started out as a varnish reverse caching proxy. Uh, and, you know, it's evolved greatly from then. And we run a lot of our own like, work of that code as well as our new product, the execute D environment. But that model of being in 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 the middle step of, of handing off and, and doing a lot of value add, but always reaching out to an origin as an authoritative source of truth. Like that's how we play. And that's what the, the storage layer here is for. Right. So for, for those kind of big files like say uh, downloads uh, in you know binaries and so on um having the data in a closer uh data center stored in a, in in a region close to the end user is even more critical so yeah, I mean, it's it's always critical right like uh the the user experience doesn't like stalls and you can no. stall on 1k of javascript or you can stall on 2 megabytes of the next video frame the users annoyed either way Great. So you can set that up via uh, the UI. There's a little shot there of the, the screens uh, replicating from uh, EU Central to US West. And uh, and we have an API as well, of course. And it's it's inter it's uh, useful to note that even you pay for the storage in uh, you know each region that it's replicated to, but you don't pay anything for the data transit between those regions. OK, so that's cloud replication. If we kind of look at uh, the simplest way of getting this working, um, Jim, Fastly allows us to create a domain with like one uh, front end URL and, and multiple back ends, right? Yeah. So um, you know, DNS points to our Edge Cloud platform, right? And then within our Edge Cloud platform, you can define a number of back ends, and that can be if else back ends, like if assets go here, if, you know, login go there, mm -hmm. uh, but they can also be load balanced uh, of just say split the traffic 50-50. And mm -hmm. then the next step that we're going to talk about here is they can also be uh, in more intelligently routed based on things like geographic proximity. Right. So here's the here's the base case with just, a, I, I created a, a URL and uh, for the domain and then two hosts or backends one in the EU and US West, and they're simply configured with 50-50 uh, load balancing. And if we have a look, you know, I ran a curl command. The, the query parameter at the end is just to defeat Fastly, so it doesn't just recognize that this is another request with the same resource. We call it but cache it, busting. <laughs> exact cache busting, yeah. So this is the way to make sure Fastly goes right back to the origin. But running it a few times, you can see that it basically picks at random with a 50-50 weighting between those uh, between those back ends. So this is great if we're say, if we're load balancing, right? We want to balance the load between uh, two origins, but it doesn't match the use case of serving up data as quickly as possible. When I actually ran this, the difference was perceptible when mm -hmm. uh, it pulled data from US West, which is where I am, despite my accent, um, or the EU, where it sounds like I should be close to. Yeah, people so, are surprisingly sensitive to even tens of milliseconds. You'll, oh, you'll, yeah. you'll feel it. Yeah, it was, it was perceptible at the command line, just from hitting enter to the next line of text uh, appearing. So um, how do we solve this? Well, the first step was to map the latency from the uh, Fastly edge nodes. and. You call those points of presence, right? Pops, yeah. Pops, yeah. To uh, the three different uh, Backblaze regions. This is a Fastly Computer Edge app. 
in 30 seconds, Computed Edge, Jim. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, so like I mentioned earlier, right, the first thing that everyone did with an Edge Cloud was was caching and they called it CDN. Uh, but everyone just had a million feature requests uh, for what else they would like it to do. And CDNs evolved to get more complicated. And eventually we realized like, no, we're really just hosting your code that does whatever you want it to do at the Edge. So Computed Edge is our uh, WASM uh, runtime that any language that can compile to WASM can be bundled in, as a binary and uploaded to our platform. And it gets automatically distributed across our thousands of nodes and our hundred or so pops uh, inside of 10 or 15 seconds. Uh, and then your code is just running everywhere around the globe. Right. And working with this is so much fun. So this is, uh, this is the core of a simple application I wrote. And I could write this, test it on my laptop, uh, push it to a uh, computed edge and then it's basically executing in every single pop around the world when uh, its URL is uh, is hit, when a request is sent to its URL. So it's incredibly powerful. And all I'm really doing here is um, getting a, a link to one of our API servers. So I'm looping through um, uh, data center three to data center five non-inclusive for loop. So basically I'm looping through uh, API 003, 4, and 5, and um, I'm just doing pretty much the simplest call. So I make that dynamic backend, um, I start a timer, and I say, okay, list the buckets. Now, this is going to fail because I'm not authenticating, but it's enough to uh, get the latency of making that request and getting the uh, response that says, hey, I don't see any um, any credentials here. Yep. And then, Even errors only travel at the speed of light. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, you know, I just uh, record this, um, how long the request took, the uh, difference between the two, um, the two, I just record the difference between the start and the end time there and send that back to uh, the client. So how this works is, um, and I have to give uh, credit here to Powell at uh, Reef Technologies, who actually built the uh, mapping infrastructure here for us. So his mapping client sends a request to the Bright Data platform. So this allows us to proxy requests through many, many points, uh, you know, geographic, uh, locations. And so it might say, okay, um, I want to send a request through Buenos Aires in Argentina to this URL. This is the URL to my pop mapper. So that uh, Bright Data sends the request to its uh, proxy. And then there are closer pops than Fortaleza in Brazil. It's just, you know, I've got a map of the world here and I wanted to Keep have enough simple, arrows. Yeah. <laughs> In reality, it would it would not travel, you know, half a continent. Um, but the Fortaleza sends, uh, sorry, uh, Buenos Aires sends a request to our uh, mapping uh, application, and then it just cycles through US West, uh, saying list buckets, and then gets its four hundred, makes a note of the time, goes to US East, does the same thing goes to EU, does the same thing, and then responds with uh, its pop code, Fortaleza, F-O-R, and then those three timings in milliseconds. And that goes back via Bright Data to the client app, so the client app then knows, okay, from Buenos Aires, the request goes to Fortaleza, and this is how long it takes from this point, the pop to the three different uh, data centers. Okay, so let's have a look at the results of that uh, exercise just with the two original regions. So if we look at latency from US West, we can see that you know everything in the western half of the US, it's really quick as you would expend as you would expect. So well under that kind of hundred millisecond uh, zone there. Even the East Coast is not bad, kind of getting up into the 75s, a few hundreds there, and then some 150s. Mm. And Europe, obviously, you can't 
you know, there's no uh, getting around the speed of light. It's going to take yeah. longer to get uh, across the Atlantic. But of course, you know, we had uh, EU Central, and obviously the the it's a essentially a mirror image uh, from yep. uh, Amsterdam. Uh, Europe is great, East Coast, yeah, and West Coast, forget about it. The, the now, two numbers I try to get people to remember most about geographic latency, since it's where most of our economic activity is occurring, is it, it costs you sixty five milliseconds to hop coasts okay. in the US, and it costs you about one hundred and twenty milliseconds to cross the pond. And right. they add up if you try to go from one to the other. Uh, yeah. And, you know, oh, either, yeah. either one of those enough is enough to start to hurt the user experience. And certainly if you have both, if you have you know, origins in California and customers in Europe, you're doing them a disservice. Exactly. So um, if we can overlay, overlay those two maps and imagine, okay, what if uh, we had data in both uh, Arizona in this case and uh, Netherlands? and we're intelligently directing requests. Well, again, Europe and the uh, western half of the US gets a pretty good deal, but the eastern half, it's kind of getting towards that 100 and kind of getting up there in some cases, some outliers around uh, like in Canada here, but it's clear that there's a, you know, there's a gap here. Yep. And this is really what uh, US East fills. So, um, you know, if you look at the, the situation with US East, um, it's in uh, Reston, Virginia there. And again, we the eastern half of the US, all is rosy. And, you know, the West and uh, Europe, you know, as we explained, you've got at least 65 milliseconds to get over here. And then what was it, 100? 20, it's about double. 120, yeah. Yeah, so which is right about where we are a little bit, I guess, in the UK. They've got yeah, you can get to there. Ireland in like 110, 115. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, that's pretty interesting. Like you can almost see the, uh, you know, as you go across here. Oh, right, yeah. Redder and, redder. and, you know, if we go back to uh, that last slide with just the two, just to kind of fix it in your mind, and then we add the third and pow, we've got really nice, we're in the green, um, everywhere dark green most locations and then a little bit paler and when we get out to uh, uh out of the uh populated areas do a victory lap like this this yeah. is great. <laughs> <laughs> so so we figured out that we can get the data faster to uh end users around the world by putting in the closest region the next step is to crunch all those numbers and we can actually build a table of uh, from the pops. So let's see. Let's test your air, air, airport codes here. So we've got Amsterdam, LaGuardia, which LaGuardia, yep, yeah, New yeah, York, East Coast, Dallas, Fort Worth, yeah, San Dallas, Juan, something, San Juan, California, San Jose, California. San Jose. San Jose oh my God, on. it's a ten-figure city in the in the US. Uh, and, I mean, East Coast. <laughs> and and London Heathrow. I'll give oh, you that. Yeah, one. Try. <laughs> so for each one of those, what we do is. We uh, have an ordered list because so you've got your first choice. If that's not available for some reason, um, we go roll to the second choice. And you know, in the worst case, the user will still get data, but it's gonna, you know, it's Cost gonna 50 milliseconds. So this is a very this is a pretty simple concept here. For each uh, pop, we've got we've got an ordered list. And we create another computer edge application. So in its configuration, uh, we have this exact same table. So this is uh, the Rust programming language. I think there's Rust and JavaScript to the two. This is the two uh, biggest right now. And also uh, in, I think it's beta, is uh, the Go. Oh, excellent. Tiny Go, yeah. Right. Uh, I started with Rust, and uh, I think Rust was the original language. And that's where yes. I started with computer edge. So, so here's my table of um, pop code to my nice ordered list array there. And then the logic um, is very, very simple. We get uh, that pop and it, usually it just appears as an environment variable. So depending, remember, this app can be running wherever it's requested in the world. It'll get a different three letter code depending on its uh, the fastly edge location it's running in or we can override it with a request parameter so we can do some testing. So we've got the pop code. 
we uh, get that row from uh, the mapping, uh, which gives us uh, a list of origins, and we loop through those origins. So it's very simple. For each of those origins, closest first, we construct a request with the correct host. We set the authentication headers, which will be different for each one. Send the request, and if everything worked out, we actually set a header to see where, say, where the data came from, and send the response, and we're done. So in the best case, this loop will be executed once, and we'll send back this response. Worst case, if if the entire <laughs> internet has gone down, then I guess we'll loop through uh, three times and fail, and you'll get back 404, which is kind of off the screen here. But the practical result is that uh, now what's happening is rather than writing like the cache busting code, we put this pop parameter on. And so this is actually telling our, um, our app to retrieve the content from different locations based on, uh, based on that pop. So if I run it from here without the pop code, it just gives me US West because mm -hmm. it'll run in San Jose. I can kind of fake the situation that it's uh, running elsewhere. And so th th this is this is the technique. It's um, yeah, the core of it is about a dozen lines of code. And by the way, uh, this is on GitHub, and I will share the uh, GitHub URL at the uh, in the resources, and it's in the uh, Bright Talk um, Bright Talk resources as well. We can go further because we build this table, but the internet doesn't stand still. Um, new links are installed. We lay new cable, um, backhoes, dig up uh, existing cable uh, accidentally. Um, and so the closest origin, the closest uh, uh, backblaze region to a given uh, fastly pop can change over time. Now, Computer Edge has got um, a dynamic store, right? Yeah, we're just starting to roll out our object store product now so that you can do key value data stashing like this. And this is, the, I, I've used it a little bit. It's really, really cool. Basically, you get a global, globally consistent store that is uh, optimized for reading. So yes. you can update it over time. Um, and I think writes take a second or two to propagate around the world, but reads are, you know, millisecond, uh, millisecond range. Yeah, writes, writes are bashed at the one second range. And then uh, the purging for when things are updated or deleted uh, is actually based on our existing cache purging. And that is the one way latency of the network, you know, the distance between the pops. So uh, the, the time when you update can actually be like, tens of milliseconds. Oh, wow. OK. And so it's pretty, you know, it's straightforward to create uh, an object store with a given name. And then it's a very similar lookup in code to just looking up that uh, pop in the uh, in the static map. So um, I guess it's time to wrap up. We've reached the uh, reaching the end of the webinar. So um, multi-region content delivery, it's it's different. It's it's not just more than load balance. It's kind of uh, it's a different use case, right, Jim? Yeah, like this kind of optimization and routing is is sort of like I think of it a lot of you know way back in the day we had the three tier internet architecture, right? Your web server, your application server, and your database. Uh, and what you know most of what the web server does basically just got moved into JavaScript from the browser, uh, and most of what the application server now is going to get moved to the edge, and then your data needs to be as close to the edge as possible, but it's harder to move than just app and just logic, right? So this, this emerging pattern of what you just did here is, is really key where you get the code out to the edge as close as possible, but then you also have a, a smaller number of geographically replicated places for the, app, for the core data, uh, and there's a replication mechanism among them. So this, it's, it's like taking the old you know, in data center architecture and spreading it out around the globe. Very cool. It's amazing what we can do. Um, with just a few clicks and a pushing code. Um, and so the mechanism, again, the mechanism within Backblaze for, do, for synchronizing that data between uh, two or three regions is cloud replication. 
And you can use the code that you just saw as a template for your own Fastly Computer Edge app. All the instructions are in the GitHub uh, repository. And uh, just to close, those resources are uh, Backblaze B2. Uh, I'm not going to read the URLs out, although I somehow end up doing that. <laughs> but you can you can find out more about Backblaze B2 and uh, sign up uh, for 10 gigabytes free of charge with no credit card at the first link there. Yeah, and similarly, you can sign up for Edge Compute and trial it for free uh, and uh, play with stuff like this, as well as a, a big chunk of cookbooks we have up on our developer site. Yeah, that, that that's good to note, actually. The, uh, the set of uh, uh, samples mm -hmm. is very comprehensive at Fastly. And then finally, if you want to uh, clone that uh, multi-region router code, there's a button there that lets you do that with um, just a click and setting up some configuration. And you can be routing requests between Backblaze regions in just a few minutes. OK, so again, uh, thanks a lot, Jim, for uh, joining me today. And uh, thank you for watching. Yeah, you're more than welcome. And thank you for the visualizations and the code. It looks great. All right. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.